gentlemen, uh, Catherine, and it is indeed a great pleasure and a great honor for me to be here tonight with all the esteemed speakers, His Eminence, Jetsuma, and uh, Tracy. I think uh, this talk, you know, the discussion on Buddhist perspective on material wealth is definitely very relevant to us in Singapore today, especially right now we're constantly discussing about, you know, what is the best way to grow our economy and, you know, how should we be measuring our own happiness and should we be having a happiness index. And in Singapore, you know, there's a place whereby material success and economic growth, you know, is a place and the highest priority, you know, we are in a place where mothers often tell our children, must study hard, must go to a good school, and you can get a high paying job, and then you will be successful. So, you know, it is definitely very interesting to have the speakers here tonight to talk to us about their perspective on material wealth and the spiritual wealth. Good evening, everyone. So don't worry, I only am given 10 minutes, <laughs> so, um, this will be short and sweet. It's a story, which some of you might know. In ancient times, there was um, uh, a king in India, and he was a very wealthy king, he had um, palaces and jewels and silks and dancing girls, very wealthy. But he was a very devout king. And he was very devoted to the Dharma. And he had a guru. And his guru was just a very simple ascetic monk who only possessed his wooden begging bowl. So one time the king and his guru, they were sitting in the garden and his guru was teaching the Dharma to the king. Meantime, a servant came running. His servants came running and said, Oh Maharaj, great king, come quickly, quickly, your majesty. The whole palace is on fire. Everything's burning. Come, come. And the king said, don't bother me, you deal with it. I am with my guru studying Dharma, you deal with the palace. And the guru jumped up and said, what do you mean? My begging bowl is in the palace. <laughs> and so this is the point. It's not what we own, but it's whether what we own owns us or we own it. That is the problem. Material possessions themselves are innocent. They, they are not to blame. But it's our grasping and attachment to those things which is the problem. So, if sitting here listening to the Dharma, somebody told you, you got a um, text message saying, quickly come back, your whole apartment is on fire, what would you do? <laughs> the question is, what comes first in our life? I'm not saying that you shouldn't go back and deal with your apartment, but in the end, what is at the center of our life? You know, are our spiritual principles at the center or our worldly grasping mind? This is what we have to ask. It's not how much we own. It's not how successful we are or we are not that makes us genuine practitioners. It's how much we grasp at what we have and how much we identify with what we have. Do we think that because we have a portion or because we have some high level in our, our firm or because we have a bigger house than anybody in our family, that that makes us better people? This is what we have to ask ourselves. 
What are we identifying with? And how important? Do we really believe that getting more and more will bring us more and more happiness? I, I think that Teresa is there. she's going to speak about how that doesn't work like that. It really doesn't because our genuine happiness and satisfaction is an inner quality which comes from the integrity of our lives and from developing those qualities of mind which bring happiness like kindness, thoughtfulness, honesty. These qualities make the mind peaceful and then genuine happiness wells up within, inside us. It's not contingent on our external factors. I found this for myself. When I was living in, in the caves, up in the mountains, I had nothing. I mean, the, the space was about this big. Clearly there was no running water, there was no electricity. In the winter, we were covered in snow for months and months. Outwardly, it looked extremely um, worse than being in a prison. And yet, I was so happy. I remember it as being the happiest time of my life. I felt very inwardly fulfilled, very inwardly satisfied. And later, when I went to visit my mother, who was living as a housekeeper in a very fancy apartment in Knightsbridge. I don't know, I mean there were three televisions and um, all, the whole place was very luxurious, but I, in the middle of London, I felt bored. And I mean that's my problem. I shouldn't have felt bored, I should have felt happy and satisfied wherever I was, but in fact I was bored. And I recalled thinking, well, always remember this, that genuine happiness does not depend on external circumstances. So what we need in this, this society which is telling you more, 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 you become more of a person the more you have, is to develop also those qualities of contentment and appreciation. Look at what you already have and be so grateful because around the world many people don't even know where their next meal is coming from. Whereas most of you, your only problem is which restaurant we're going to eat at. <laughs> But I come from India and many, many people, they don't even have enough food for the next day to feed their family. So think of how much you have already. How many ladies, how many clothes do you already own? Do you really need more? Most people already have more than enough clothing to last for one lifetime. Probably enough clothing for many lifetimes. Why more and more and more? Why not use that money for something meaningful? Develop contentment, a joy in what you already have. My message basically is that it's not it's not things which are the problem. It's our relationship to things which is the problem. As the Buddha said, the source of our unhappiness, of our dissatisfaction, our dukkha, is, is grasping and craving. It's not the things which are the problem. It's our attitude, our unhealthy attitude. If we have a healthy attitude, which appreciates things, but is able to let them go if they leave, then there's no problem. But it's when we, we hold on to these things, thinking that this 
on this depends my happiness and my satisfaction, that's when we're in deep trouble. Because the more and more that we accumulate, it's just filling up a black hole. It never can be satisfied. As the Buddha said, greed and grasping is like salty water. The more we drink, the thirstier we get. And, and wandering around your malls shows me this. For the people, with everything in the world, and yet they still think that if only they had that whatever, that that would somehow give them inner satisfaction. But it doesn't. Because the more you drink, the thirstier you get. So why not reverse the trend? Even as an experiment, practice appreciating what you already have, feeling content with where you are, and a joy in sharing and giving and making others happy through what you yourself have acquired. I think one of the questions is, how much should you give? Will you give whatever your heart tells you? <coughs> I don't think there's a set price. But really, Singapore is a treasure island because it not only has great material wealth, it also has the wealth of the Dharma. And at the end of your life, I think you will find that the wealth of the Dharma was much more meaningful for you than all your material wealth which, after all, we cannot take with us anyway. What you can take with you is how you have dealt with your mind. Because wherever you go, your mind goes with you. And so please, all of you, spend more time on cultivating the inner qualities. Those are the true treasures, along with your external wealth. Otherwise, you will end up with lots and lots of cars and inwardly feel very impoverished and wonder, was that the only meaning to my life, to get yet another portion? Thank you. Thank you, Jessica, for the illuminating of us. Now, we invite our second keynote speaker, His Eminence, Elwa Dukampa, on stage, please. His Eminence, please. Singapore for organizing this and all of you for participating. And I truly enjoy these kind of dialogues with other great masters because every time I always believe that every individual have gone in their own life ups and downs and they learn some way to deal with this up and down and they have their own wisdom which everybody you know, can be benefited. So whenever I do these kind of talk with a scientist, with a businessman, a woman, actress, actress, I always receive some knowledge and wisdom from them for which I am very grateful. So this is something I truly enjoy. Though I myself may be the least of the knowledgeable, but uh, you know, I enjoy this in terms of what I learned. And, um, and uh, even though we have kind of uh, two to this master, when the uh, Chisholm has already spoken. So I want to approach it from a little bit kind of a different angle. Because Buddha, Shakyamun is so kind. Some people think that Buddhism is very complicated because there's you know, Theravada, Mahayana, Vajrayana. Within Mahayana also you have the pure land, the Zen. And so kind of complicated. They just want some simple thing, you know, just say yes. Everybody dress same, eat same, say the same thing. And ultimately, if you study the Buddhism deeper, you will find that ultimately it's the same. But the fact that it is a different doesn't make Buddhism complicated, it actually makes it more beautiful. Because all of us are not same. If we are all same, today all of you guys will be wearing green t-shirt, white pant, all will be the same, but not. We are all different. So Buddha, in his wisdom, infinite wisdom, gave us different teachings according to the different needs. So that's why even if 10 Buddhist master comes, I will still feel that we will learn 10 different you know, wisdoms, equally precious, equally respected. From, and the, for today's kind of the touching on the today's subject, 
the reason when the Duga Singapore proposed this and said, what do you feel about it? I said, it's a very good idea. Because somebody, a friend of mine in the business circle in the Hong Kong, they told me that uh, many of their wealthy friends, um, either they don't like to be Buddhist, because they think that if you're a Buddhist, you have to, be, you have to live in poverty. Mm -hmm. Buddhism and the wealth is something against. Or, or they are unhappy wealthy Buddhists. Because they feel that I should actually be not attached. I should not have attachment to my car, my wealth, yet I can't help it. You know, I love my wealth so much. So I am a you know, kind of a conflicted Buddhist. You know, conflicted with what I have, unhappy, trying to be a good Buddhist, yet I can't. So kind of angry with oneself. At the same time, when other people are driving, you know, kind of having wealth, very attached. You know, I should not do like that. You should not do like that. that he should not do like that. One should not do like this, you know, like should. We want to improve everybody else except ourselves. <laughs> and spiritual transformation is not about looking at others, it's about looking at ourselves. What can I do to transform myself? It's not about you make everybody else beautiful, you will become beautiful. This is not the spiritual that we can taught. So that's why when this topic came up, I was actually quite uh, interested. I was, I found it very, I thought, yes, you know, since there are different types of people in the world, it might be benefited. So my own kind of the understanding, limited understanding from the Buddhist perspective, Buddhist teachings, is that from the Buddhist point of view, like Chizuma said, wealth itself is very innocent. It's neither negative nor positive from the Buddhist point of view. It can be used Positively, you can help so many people, or you can use to kill thousands of people. You, know, you can, can use it, it is a tool. It is like the iPhone and the computer. You can use it for Dharma purpose, Facebook, like the way you guys are here, for the Dharma purpose, or I can use it for, I don't know, you can use it for, there's a you know, big dance, 2000, I don't know, New Year Eve's party, probably more people will come. <laughs> so it can be used for any purpose. And wealth itself, do if you ask, does a Buddhist reject wealth itself because it is a, because of because it is a wealth, it has to be rejected. I don't think so. I don't think that Buddhists will say that you if you are wealthy, you have to reject your wealth. You have to live in poverty. And that is the only way to practice Dharma. I don't think that Buddhists will say Buddhist. I don't think that is the you know the view. Rather one, Buddhists will say that even if you are driving a Porsche, even if you have the most wealthy person, you should be humble. That Buddha Dhamma will say. What is the meaning of humbleness? Imagine the idea of humbleness is don't drive, you know, Porsche car. You know, don't drive, the, don't wear the Gucci bag. Be humble, you know, if possible, you know, wear very, you know, like normal clothes. Drive a normal, impossible walk, you know, like we did in Sri Lanka one month, you know, at the kind welcome of the Sri Lankan monks and government. That's humbleness, yes. If you, as soon as you are in the nice car, nice dress, you are humble, you are proud. That is very subjective. That may or may not be true. As in so, because if just by being in poverty, if you are spiritual, everybody in the poor country is enlightened by now. Many are without no clothes at all. They are walking each and every day. They will be going barefoot. So they will be enlightened by now. They will be happy all the time. Or if it's enlightenment spiritual has to do with the wealth, then again the same. Everybody in the wealthy country will be enlightened. They will all be become Buddhas. So it doesn't necessarily have to do with the project, with the objects. So what does humbleness really mean? <coughs> Humbleness can be many things, but from my understanding is you have to respect others. How do you respect others? By not falsely believing, creating some image in yourself that we are better than others because I have a Porsche, because I have a bank balance, I am better than others. So if you have that kind of pride, what do you do? I don't respect your wish. I won't even give you five minutes of my time. You are nobody. You drive in a Porsche car, okay.
okay? You are like me, I'll give you time. Yeah, was, so you are disrespecting. From disrespecting comes pride. From disrespecting comes lack of understanding, lack of caring, lack of compassion. So the disrespect comes because of the, the pride. Pride, pride. So pride is, from my understanding, is the disrespect by believing that one is greater. So if, so for example, my, you know, one of my you know, wealthy friends, my family is, you know, what kind of thing, you know, the very close, uh, they, told, they told me that. Uh, sometimes I believe there are certain clubs in the Singapore, and to be a member of that costs you millions of money. And the reason why people become of that club is because that gives you a status symbol that you are more special than other human beings. You know, you are because we have no other way to show our, how special we are. We have no no wings, no halo around our thing. So we need to kind of uplift ourselves through such a things. If that is our motivation to buy a Porsche, then definitely better not. You know, then better not buy a Porsche because the pride will become bigger and bigger and very difficult. Then you have to change the Porsche all the time. Moment your competitor has a new Porsche, again have to buy a new Porsche. You know? And you won't be enjoying your Porsche at all because you'll be always checking, is my am I the latest? What does my competitor have? My you know my competitor has two Porsche, I must, you know buy two, you know, kind of a uh, two portion. So you will not be enjoying your wealth at all. So from my understanding, it is the whether you are wealthy, if you are very, because of your good karma, you are fortunate, yes. You can enjoy your Porsche without being pride, without thinking that you are special. You are special because you are, you know, you have a Porsche. That pride definitely should not be there. By Porsche, it seems good or bad, it's very, it's a very kind of, you know, the, it depends on the individual, how they perceive it. And actually, the fact that nowadays we consider Porsche to be good is very much, in a way, very much illusioned, very much a conceptual. As, as I always say, fashion, status, is very much within the mind. It's not really out there. In these days, generation time, if you drive a Porsche, Gucci bag, or whatever, you are considered successful or wealthy. But hundred years ago, how do the rich people do? They go on a horse, <laughs> ten horses, Arabian stallions. Nowadays, the rich people, successful people, go on a horse. Everybody will laugh at them. Why? Because the concept has changed. Horse has not changed. Horse, still the Arabian stallions are there. And if you in this time and day, you want it is the concept of our conceptual mind has changed of what is you know status, happiness, uh, sorry. It's, successful, not successful, it's very much within the mind, so there's no need to be that proud also, even if you have a, you know, Porsche or wealthy, you know, so what? It doesn't have to be that much, you know, kind of thing. And um, the second kind of the, the point that uh, I would like to kind of, you know, to share is that um, the modern society has the tendency to kind of through maybe the media or through kind of implication, indirect implication, gives us a kind of idea that uh, in order for us to be happy, we all have to look like movie star. Skin, very clear skin, like almost, you know. In the olden days, it was if you have a beautiful face, it's enough. Now it's not. Face, feet, top to hair to kind of, even the eyebrows have to be perfect. So a lot of job nowadays, you know, so of course a lot of business, I guess, also. But, you know, very, you know, that's why I heard nowadays, uh, you know, uh, when uh, it takes a lot of time to prepare for dinner and all of that. You know, so I heard of that. So, you know, and that kind of concept is there, that we all have to be, you know, look like a movie star. And we all have to become, you know, millionaires and all. Then only you'll be happy. Every time in the television or something, you image of happy comes always looks like a very beautiful, very wealthy. In the television and movies, I hardly see, you know, like a kind of poor people or middle class kind of, you know, looking happy. And I don't see much. Usually, every advertisement is about beautiful men and women, very wealthy, and they are very happy. <laughs> the kind of stress behind it, kind of the sacrifice behind it, they usually doesn't show about it. So that gives us maybe to you guys it's okay because I think you guys are quite mature, knows the world. 
but usually kind of the, in, the, in the school children, you know, because I go to a lot of schools and colleges, I always tell them that this is unachievable. <laughs> not if all of us are not going to look like movie star at all. And in by some miracle, if we did, we will no longer be beautiful. For example, just a month ago, I had given, we had a talk in Malaysia with one supermodel, a model from, I think she's Singapore also, what's uh, Bernie Chan. Mm -hmm. So we were, I was just example showing to her that uh, the reason why she's considered a model is that she, we are all not beautiful like her. If we are all beautiful like her, she will no longer be a model. <laughs> huh? Why? She looks like us, what is so special about it? And somebody whom we right now consider to be ugly, that will be the supermodel. <laughs> so unique. Yeah. That's why throughout the generation, the beauty of concept, concept of the beauty has changed so much. Look at the history. So, so that is, we are kind of caught up in a very kind of a strange trap of our own making. First of all, we can't be very beautiful all the time. If we do manage to become beautiful, we are no longer beautiful. You know? All of us cannot become millionaires and billionaires. If we do, we will no longer be wealthy. Because <laughs> everybody is a millionaire. You know? For example, compared to... I once, one year ago, I was reading a magazine in Kuala Lumpur. It said that uh, nowadays, millionaires don't feel like a millionaire. Because the inflation has caught up so much. The million dollar doesn't make any, it has no value. So that's why sometimes I wonder the development, very developed countries, they say they work so that you know like you will become wealthy, but you have to in order to do that, you have to sacrifice your health so much. And there's a saying by one great master that I think I did say a few days ago that uh, he was asked, What do you find most strange thing in the world? He said the human beings. Because they sacrifice their health in order to gain wealth. And this, they spend their wealth recuperating their health. <laughs> they live as if they are never going to die. And they die having never lived. So similarly, like, you know, you, a lot of sacrifice needed to be millionaire, let's say. But when you do find a millionaire, you say, now I can retire. Unless you become very, very wealthy, I don't know. Inflation costs up so much, going up so much. Your million doesn't have the value that that was 10 years ago. But in the process, you know, like the Henry David Thoreau said one very thing is, the price of doing anything in the, anything is the amount of life you spend, you spend for it. So you have spent 10 years of your life, sacrificed so much. Time with your family, your own happiness be so much. Is it really worth it? So anyway, like compared to people in like a very poor country, Everybody in Singapore is millionaire. <laughs> Billionaire, multi times over, from their perspective. Do we all feel like that? It depends on in, all individual. Whether you look up or whether you look down. Even if the billionaire, millionaires themselves, whether they look up billionaire, they probably feel poor. Whether they look down, maybe they feel rich, but usually we don't look down. We always you know, kind of look up. When we do the part yatras, the walking pilgrimage, Sri Lanka this time was very wonderful because the government was very kind and we mostly not much mountain. But in Ladakh, when we did, we had to climb the mountains which are so steep and so high, 5,500 meters, that uh, when you kind of uh, go up, there's a joke saying that when you look at that mountain, your head falls off. It's so <laughs> steep. <laughs> so, so then, you know, when we uh, climb this mountain, it is so discouraging because from the down it looks like it, I will never reach the top. How can I ever, my two feet, how can it ever reach up? So that time we learned a trick from the local people. They say that when you are climbing up, never look up, look down. <laughs> then you feel, oh, I have walked quite a lot. Uh -huh. At that time I started is down there. <laughs> so you feel very encouraged to walk up. Similarly, in a life, instead of thinking what I am going to achieve tomorrow or day after, if we can look down a little bit, what we have in terms of wealth, in terms of family, in terms of loved one, good health, I think we will be a little bit, I think, more encouraged. We can go up if you want to, if that is what you want, why not? But it should not, if we cannot appreciate what we have right now, even if you go up, it should be the same. Then you want to go up, go up, 
and the life will be finished. So with this kind of context in the mind, since I do come from, I do live most of the time in Bhutan, I do come from Bhutan, I must say that the Bhutan's concept of the gross national happiness doesn't make a sense. If you think in a spiritual terms of value, if you think development is only key, GNH doesn't make sense. It's a rubbish. If you think only economical development, then GNH is rubbish. There's no point discussing about it. But if you believe that, then the, the Bhutanese concept of the GNH, which is based on Buddhist philosophy, does make a lot of sense. They say that everybody needs material wealth. That's for sure. You need at least what they said was a home of your yourself. Because when you have a certain home, you have a sense of security. And home, I don't think they mean like a lone home, like modern world. <laughs> you know, down in the Bhutan and all of this, they don't have that much concept of loan very much. Rather, they can save and then they buy. And anyway, kind of a secure home, and then a secure work, and then ability to provide your family to that much you need. Every government recognizes that. But that's so they say like 50% of your effort should go into material things money, house, and so on. And then the 30% should be uh, towards, 20% I think should be towards your family. Because the happiness comes also from family. If you don't have time to share your wealth with your family, human being happiness is very much dependent on others. What do human beings define happiness as? Love, respect, care, you know, all of this comes from other human beings. So you have to care for others, give time for others. So that you receive love, appreciation, so and so. So we do have to give time for the family. So they, they said about 20% I think. Then maybe the 10% was environment, good health, and good governance. Then the 20% they say have to give into the spiritual understanding. Spirituality we have to give. Because without spirituality, such a concept that we have been discussing today will not make sense. We will always be looking up the mountain, not the down. We're always thinking just because we are Porsche, we are very great. I am very, actually, instead of thinking, you know, instead of sometimes you should be, and when we are driving, when we are driving Porsche, we should be laughing at ourselves. What a funny world we are in. Today I'm conceptually driving Porsche, I'm very happy. 100 years ago I will be driving horse and I'll be feeling very VIP. How conceptual world this is. And we should be laughing at ourselves. You know, while we are driving Porsche, we should be laughing at ourselves how we can delude ourselves. You may be driving Porsche, you may be not, for what certain purposes. For example, even you may be enlightened or spiritual or whatever, but if you are a bank CEO or you are ambassador of the country, you cannot say, I am a spiritual person and I will just walk to meet the other country's president. You know, I am a very spiritual, because that is the kind of norm in the material world. So you live by the rule of the material world if you need to. If you are living in a mountain, you don't need Porsche. If you need to live by because of your job, because of the rules of the material world, you may or may not. But definitely the pride, the kind of you know, the misunderstanding that you know the wealth, status, happiness is something that external. I don't think that should be there. So this is the, I think what I can remember. This is what I what these are my own thoughts. Thank you very much. I will, I will ask the three questions that the audience have voted, you know, the three questions that have gotten the highest votes. Um, the first question maybe be to His Eminence. This is a question on uh, spiritual development. Uh, you already have uh, mentioned earlier on in your speech. So should spiritual development be placed above material pursuits? And can a spiritual master drive a Porsche? Or maybe a Lamborghini or Maserati? <laughs> <laughs> Asking whether Tracy should be speaking, she won't have a chance. Life, 
whatever happens, whatever ups and downs you go through, never give up spiritual practice. He said, he told me that. And um, after some time, of course, I, you know, I, out of respect and, you know, the way, of course, I said, definitely. Only, it's only after a long time that it made some, it made a sense to me. Because spiritual wealth is something that is not dependent on any other condition, not dependent on the market force, Dow Jones, you know, and the, what is the latest fashion. It is very much dependent on the wisdom and compassion that we can develop within ourselves. For example, a sense of relaxation about, of course, we should be dressed nicely, very fashionably dressed, definitely. Look the most beautiful, why not? Especially, you know, just because you are Buddhist doesn't mean you have to look ugly. Definitely not. Especially if you are going to a temple, you should look the most beautiful, most smart. It's offering to the Buddhists. And also as a good image for the Buddhism in general. You say, oh, I don't want to be a Buddhist. You know? Buddhist is always like a sloppy, like a hippie. You know? I don't want to be a Buddhist, you know, which you might say. Definitely not. Very nicely you should be dressed. By the same time, understanding that the concept of the beauty that I represent or that I feel, it's very much a conceptual mind. What I find beautiful, what others find beautiful at this time may not may change differently. J pop, K pop, you know, all of these. So not so kind of you know serious about your how nicely you are dressed. Not jealous about it. Definitely if you want to be wealthy, especially you are wealthy in, or, in order to become, make a difference to all the sentient beings, make a difference, why not? Like Aung San Suu Kyi said in the movie, The Lady, she said, it's not the power that corrupts, it's the fear of losing power. In the hands of a great enlightened being, or let's say a Buddhist, a great, uh, forget a Buddhist, a great person, a wonderful person, power is nothing wrong. He or she use it for the right purpose. Wealth is nothing wrong, it can be used for the right purpose. So that is why, you know, material wealth itself, I don't think there's anything wrong with having it. But the spiritual should be definitely there. So one day, maybe let's say we are beautiful for, I don't know, 10 years. And then we do uh, exercise, yoga, and botox for another 10 years. Uh, so by 20 years, maybe till 30, 45, we can push it. Right? If you're a man, maybe 55. Right? After that, we are going to lose it. Then how are you going to deal with it? When you are beautiful, how proud you are, how truly you believe it really existed, you don't understand your mind, how attached you are to your mindset. Or if you are wealthy, how truly you believe that wealth is something that is, exists externally rather than conceptual, individual or collective concept. Like I told you, from compared to people in a poor country, everybody, they will think your guys are very rich. Singaporean goes and tells somebody in Africa, I'm very poor, they will laugh at you. They say, what is, are you crazy? So it is very much a conceptual mind. So with this understanding, one day you become poor. You know, if you are of course going too poor to the hunger, to the hungry, going to the hunger and starving, definitely that is pain. But let's say from 100 million you become 50, 50 million dollar. You know, does it really make sense with that much worry? Are you really that desperate? I don't think so. But if you don't know, then you know, today the Dow Jones index go up, very happy. Tomorrow one, two point go down, very stressed and heart attack. Then you know, there's something, and then like, you know, the power, there's power, honor, all of these things. If you take the power things too seriously, power is also very much illusioned. For example, you are VIP in your country, outside your country, nobody knows you. Why are you VIP in that country? Because collectively people have kind of come to a conclusion that you are somebody. So you become somebody. Actually, I feel that every president and the important people, they know that. That is why you will find the most of the important people, they always have a lot of external things to kind of, you know, to show the status of the power. For example, cars, the motorcade, the presidential seal. Because without these, you know, like I said earlier, there's no wings, there's no halo around us to make anyone special. You know? So you need this illusion to kind of, you know, the, Grandeur to this, you know that it is very much illusion that is being created, and it works very much very well also. So anyway, but if you believe in that spiritually, what your own creating of illusion of power, one day you lose power. 
Hence, many people who are starting to lose power, starting to lose business, they can't handle it. They feel so ashamed of the society, what people will think, all of that. In the reality, you know, one of my friends told me, she's not a Buddhist, she's a friend of mine. She said, you shouldn't worry too much about other people, what they're thinking about you. They're busy thinking about themselves. <laughs> they have no time to worry about you. But they, they feel so something that then they kill themselves, suicide themselves, you know, because that's true. Holding on the sense of that pride on or whatever. So definitely if you have that, uh, spiritual wealth should be a priority, because that is something everlasting, you always be with you. And because of spiritual wealth, you enjoy your wealth more. You appreciate your wife, husband more, your country more, your wealth more. You will be more at peace, definitely, I think so. Priority should be spiritual wealth. Secondary wealth, material wealth, oh, definitely. Now in terms of driving Porsche or not, it depends on, first it depends on which yana you ask. You know, for example, the Theravada Yana, Theravada, it's the, according to Vinaya, strictly speaking, Vinaya, uh, which is, I think, followed by Sri Lanka and the Thailand and Burma, and Burma, I'm not very sure, where, in general speaking, you know, monks are supposed to go barefoot. They are supposed to go, you know, the begging. They have to go and beg for the food. It's not because they are poor. They have to go and beg for the food. But these terms of, you know, the begging and all, these are not considered, you have to beg all your life. You know? Even after you become enlightened, you have to beg. I don't think it means that. Maybe Buddha begged because to show us. But the reason why, to, why the monks are supposed to do like that is to develop humility. You know? Because most people who drive Ferrari, Come automatically come under the influence of the illusion that they are special than others because they have Ferrari, they have Armani clothes, so and so. And some may not. Those who do not do not have like that, they don't feel proud. We cannot say that every rich man is a bad, every poor man is a humble and human, very nice, kind person. We can't say that. Depend on individual. Maybe there are millions of some rich people who are very humble, very down to earth, who uses his who knows, you know, it's a, you cannot say like that. That's the what the the model of the Chisumas, you know, the story was king was very rich, but he has no attachment, so he burned the palace down in the mind. The king guru was he doesn't have a wealth, but he's attached to his begging bowl, and he was very upset. So whether you're upset to a begging bowl, your one suit of cloth, or whether you're attached to a, your hundred suit of cloth, attachment is same, pain is same, it's the same. So that's why, generally speaking, shall monks all go in Ferrari or not? Or, you know, I don't, I would say in general, no. But individually, can we judge? To do that, you have to be able to read other person's mind. That's why Buddha said, judge others only if you are like me. That means when you reach a Buddha, you can read other people's mind. What is that? How attached they are? with how much strong conceptual they are, you know, then you can judge them. You cannot do like that. You know? Maybe the monastery, the abbot can say, because there, there's a rule for general you have to follow. But as individual practitioner, do everybody is not allowed to you know, as, as soon as he, for somebody drives a drives Ferrari, you are bad. Can we say that? We can't say like that. And Buddhist, the one thing we must remember, Buddhism is not a religion. Therefore, Buddha's laws are not the law of the country. For example, law of the country, if you break it, that's it. You are illegal, you are breaking the law. But the Buddha's, Buddha's laws are as a method to transform you. So as a, as a method, there can be many methods. Theravada is Theravada method. Mahayana is Mahayana method. Theravada monks are not allowed to touch gold. Mahayana will say that if it's for, if you have no sufficient, for the sake of sentient being, you can touch the gold. Among the ten negative deeds, the three mind you cannot do, but others you can do. Vajrayana will say, what is gold, what is diamond? You know? <laughs> who says diamond is good? Actually, who says? Diamond doesn't say, I am special, I am precious. We human beings conceptually say, this is a diamond, very good. This is a stone, oh, worth nothing. This is a money, very good. Money is what? Actually, it's a paper. What is credit card? Plastic. But we all agree to be valuable, so it becomes valuable. No? So Vajrayana will say more important, yes, important to give up if necessary. That depends on you. 
what kind of guy you are. For example, it's like a, you know, like a, it's like a television, simply speaking. Some people are so addicted to computer and television, some of the children, you have to literally lock the computer away. You know? Some people can watch the television, use the computer in a balanced way, in a, even in a beneficial way. So for these, definitely you should not lock away the computer. So it, it is a, individually speaking, it differs from individual to individual. Uh, that is you know, my, my view. If I made any mistakes, you know, I, you know, I apologize to so many learned monks and monks and the nuns are here. Thank you very much. Thank you, The next question is for Jack Silver, and it is a question on uh, how we should be spending our money wisely. Buddhism says that uh, we should give whenever there is a need and without expecting any returns. But in reality, there are so many charities and causes that we cannot support them all. How can we give wisely and with the greatest benefit? And personally, I'd like to ask, you know, how much should we give? There is a uh, Tibetan story about a, a monk who saw an old man, a uh, starving old man, and he cut off his flesh to feed the old man. So, you know, how far, you know, how much should we be giving to charity? You know, I don't think that there is any um, written rule about this. Um, in some Christian churches, and I think in Islam, uh, it is said that one should give 10% of one's income to others in charity. But I don't think in Buddhism uh, there's any specified um, amount. So I think that people should give what feels right for them. If you have lots of money, then you can afford to give more. If you, uh, by giving and giving and giving to others, you are depriving your family, then maybe you should um, echo. Maybe this one's better. Is that better? Yes. Is that, I can hear an echo. Can you hear an echo? Anyway, so I, I think one you has to use not only one's um, compassion, but also one, one's uh, common sense and wisdom in so far as how much to give. And who to give for means to give to people that you personally uh, feel you're, you're interested in. Of course there are 10 million charities, but um, you know, what, what speaks to you? What are you interested in? Some people like to give, like to to orphanages, or to hospitals, or to schools. Other people like to give to the arts, or to cultural programs, and there's no right and wrong. It, it's just what what is of particular interest to, to the individual. But definitely it is very helpful to um, use one's wealth for, for benefiting others as well as oneself. And there's a great joy in giving. I mean, the people I know who are the most generous are often the most inwardly contented and happy people. And those who are frightened to give because if I give to them, what will I have for myself, are often the, the most unhappy and dissatisfied people. So, of course, it is very, um, what can you say? I mean, it's common sense, really. How much do we spend on ourselves? How much are we uh, happy to give to others? Each one has to ask themselves. But we should remember that generosity is uh, the first of the paramitas. It's the first of the qualities needed to be developed in order to become a Buddha. Um, so these qualities such as generosity and ethics and patience and enthusiastic effort and then meditation and wisdom, it starts with generosity. Because I think the Buddha understood that, you know, once we learn how to open up our hands, 
that follows with a sense of opening up the heart. And even if we are not very wise, even if we cannot meditate, even if our ethics are a bit iffy, nonetheless we can learn to share with others and to be generous. And this is a way of, of learning compassion, of learning empathy, of learning kindness, of not always thinking only of me, but of extending ourselves to others. Not only in the sense of money, but in the sense of time and sympathy and understanding. This, this quality of generosity is an opening of the heart. And so it's very essential on the spiritual path, and it's one reason why all spiritual paths mention it uh, very importantly, because no matter what level we may be at, we can always afford to share. So um, in this way, it's a very important quality for learning our interdependence with others and, and stop ourselves being so totally self-absorbed. <coughs> Thank you, Jessica. All right, now this is a question for Tracy. Actually, two questions because there's a tie for these two questions. First of all, Tracy, perhaps you could share with us you know, how do you incorporate Buddhist teachings in your working life right now? And as I'm sure you know, Tracy works in Citibank, so incorporating Buddhist values in the banking career. So, how do you do that? And the second question is how would you, what can you advise young professionals? about balancing spiritual, spirituality and materialism when they are considering their various career choices. You know, Jessuma is rolling her eyes because she, she realized that I'm totally uh, ill-equipped to answer the two questions. <laughs> I, I think I have, to, I have to set the record straight here. You know, concept is, uh, is evidence is, uh, is a very important thing. First of all, I'm, I'm a absolute newcomer to Buddhism, believe it or not. Um, I, as a child, I, I always remember my parents uh, going to the temple, praying, and they would always ask for you know, study hard, pass your exams, and be good, and, and all the wonderful things, and, and they pray for them, and they, uh, you know, they say they would do all kinds of wonderful things if, all the children were good and what have you, and I thought to myself as a young child, you know, this can't be right, right? I, I, I never thought that that was something I wanted to grow up uh, believing religion was, so I, I have been ignorant uh, for years in my life. Uh, I first met Jetsuma last year, uh, a very dear friend of mine actually invited me to a concert and he said to me, by the way, there's going to be a uh, a very interesting person that's going to attend and he wanted me to meet her and he actually gave me two of her books. I was uh, just about to get on a plane to New York uh, and I brought your two books with me. <laughs> so I read, I started reading In the Heart of Life and I, I got to New York and I messaged my friend, I said, hey, this book is good and he says, no, 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 you should start with Cave, uh, Snow in, Cave in, Cave in the Snow. <laughs> The wrong book, so I read the other book first. Uh, and then, of course, I came back and I met Jetsuma. Um, and I was so in awe, I didn't know what to say to her. Um, and I, I told her this story about, you know, when I was young, about not understanding Buddhism, and this was the first time I read her books. And Jetsuma very kindly, very subtly said to me, Oh, good. And she says, You know, normally when people read, uh, they'd be lucky if they can remember 10%. That's been very lucky. I think she was very kind. She was trying to encourage me because actually uh, I've been trying to read her book again and again before tonight thinking, you know, <laughs> I haven't remembered enough. Um, and then I was very fortunate to be invited to lunch and I met his eminence and he, he made me feel very good because he said, you know, if a doctor decides to help people by becoming a monk, that's a bad idea because, you know, it takes 20, 30 years to be a monk. So, so I'm sitting here hoping that you all understand I'm, I'm neither a devout Buddhist or an aspiring nun because I'm, <laughs> I'm totally new to this. Um, 
Actually, I, I don't know how Takan and Catherine convinced me to come up here and reverse the uh, when, they, when they first told me about this talk and they said, you know, it's going to be Porsche and the Buddha, and I thought, uh oh. That's actually, I do drive a Porsche. <laughs> Not that he, he knows. Um, uh, but she, actually, my husband drives it all the time. I, I get to drive it some of the time. I actually take the taxis most of the time because I, I, I work. Um, and I'm not attached to it. I, I thought very hard about the questions that uh, Catherine had put up. And, you know, am I really happy with this? I, actually, when I thought about driving, uh, I said this to Jet so my Miss Eminence earlier. Uh, the happiest moment about driving actually was when I got my license 40 years ago and I had a little Honda Civic. I was really happy. Uh, you know, the Porsche today, yeah, I get in the car and it's a nice car and it gets me to work. Um, I can't tell you that, I can't sit here and tell you that, you know, I, I incorporate Buddhist um, teachings in my work because, as I said, I didn't know much about Buddhism at the time. But when I first read Jetsuma's books, um, what resonated within me was all the things that I believed in sounded really logical and made sense. And as His Eminence said, you know, it's not really a religion, it's, it's the beliefs and the principles and the practice. Um, Sitting, sitting there and listening to you talk about you know, looking up and looking down. Um, when I started out in banking, honestly, I didn't know that was the career I wanted to be in. So I didn't choose it. I didn't choose it because I thought that would make me rich. Uh, do I have time to tell the story why I became a banker? <laughs> it takes, takes 10 seconds. I, I was at a very rich man's house for uh, Chinese New Year. Thank you.